Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Today, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the Director General of WHO, has welcomed the family of Henrietta Lacks to WHO to honor her life, her legacy, and its significance for health equity. To get us started, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Alfred Lacks Carter, Jr., who will share with us a short biography and his mother's story. Good afternoon. My name is Alfred Carter. Henrietta Lacks was my grandmother. My grandmother was a black American woman who was born on August 1st, 1920 in Roanoke, Virginia to Eliza and Johnny Pleasant. Sometime after her birth, her name was changed from Loretta to Henrietta. When she was still a young child, Henrietta's mother passed away. She was then moved to a farm in Clover, Virginia to be raised by her grandfather. In 1941, Henrietta married David Day Lax. As a young mother, Henrietta moved north with Day to find opportunities in Baltimore. They eventually made a home in the area. There, the Lacks built a life for themselves and their five children, Lawrence, Elsie, David, Deborah, and Joseph. My grandmother went to Johns Hopkins to seek medical treatment after experiencing extensive bleeding. She was soon diagnosed with cervical cancer. The disease quickly consumed her body despite treatment. Eight months later, at age 31 years of age, Henrietta's life was cut short on October 4, 1951. She left behind her children, her husband, and her immortal selves that would change the world. That is because, unbeknownst to Henrietta, without her knowledge and without her consent, medical researchers had taken samples of her tumor during her treatment. Those cells were remarkably resilient, proving to be a breakthrough in cell research. The first immortal cell line doubling every 24 hours, dividing and replenishing indefinitely in a laboratory. These miracle cells will be called HeLa cells, derived from the first two letters of her first and last name. Soon, Henrietta Lacks' cell will grow by the millions, commercialized, distributed worldwide for researchers and enabling countless advances in medicine. While HeLa cells were making a global impact, Henrietta's family was not informed. It was not until 20 years after her death that we would learn how science retrieved her cells and her grandmother's enormous contribution to medicine and humanity. Thank you for joining us as we honor Henrietta Lacks and her legacy, which has touched the whole entire world. significance, to address the significance to the scientific and medical community, it's now my distinct privilege to give the floor to Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist of WHO. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be with the Lax family in the same room. And thank you all so much for being here with us today as we remember the contributions of your grandmother or great-grandmother to the scientific community worldwide. I remember in medical school hearing the word HeLa cell very often in class, and yet, you know, there's such a story, such a long story behind, um, and I'm glad that we're getting to tell the story today. Of course, the world is not going to be the same again after the HeLa phenomenon began in 1951. And since then, there's been mass production of these cells, which, as you heard, are immortal cells, easy to multiply in the laboratory, and have been used for all kinds of research. They've traveled across the world. In fact, they've even traveled into space. And the HeLa cells are continuously used for research and to test theories about the cause and treatment of diseases. It's estimated that something like 50 million metric tons of HeLa cells have been used worldwide by researchers and scientists. And this has resulted in something like 
75,000 scientific publications in the literature. So this is just enormous when you think about it and it's probably very unique. I cannot think of any other single cell line or lab uh, reagent that's been used uh, to this extent and has resulted in so many advances. So for more than six decades, we've had um, Henrietta Lacks prolific cells continue to grow and contribute. In fact, the genome of that cell line has been sequenced and has also been a lot of uh, topic of, of debate and discussion as to how cancer affects human cells. It's been used for the development of many products, including the polio vaccine and drugs for treating cancer, HIV AIDS, hemophilia, leukemia, Parkinson's disease. It's been used to understand the impact of radiation and zero gravity on human cells. It's been used to study the impact they understand what happens in cancer as far as the genes in the body are concerned, the chromosomes. And therefore, it's given rise to advances that are useful for not only cancer treatment, but also for precision medicine, for targeting treatments <clears throat> to individuals based on their genome. And even being used in the current coronavirus pandemic because it really forms the basis of tissue culture and therefore many vaccines and drugs that are developed uh, use HeLa cells in the laboratory to be tested. And of course, it also allowed for the development of HPV vaccine, which is a vaccine against the human papilloma virus that causes cervical cancer, which is the disease that killed Henrietta Lacks. So while she died of cervical cancer, her legacy has helped and will continue to help many women and girls around the world um, not get cervical cancer. And of course, one of the urgent priorities today is really scaling up HPV vaccine for young girls around the world so we can actually prevent, this is one cancer that's, that's preventable. So once again, thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to be a part of this uh, function today. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for highlighting her enduring legacy to medical science. <clears throat> And now I'd like to turn the floor over to the Director General, Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Lacks, Alfred, uh, Victoria, Veronica, Alan, Pamela, Joel, and also Professor uh, Parham, uh, dear colleagues and friends. First, it's my great honor to welcome you to WHO to honor your mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother Henrietta Lacks. The story of Henrietta Lacks and her family has been told in different ways by different people. Many thought to hide or alter things about her, her race, her name, her identity. That's why today I have invited you, her family, to WHO, so you can share your family story in your own words. What happened to Henrietta was wrong for at least three reasons. First, she lived in a time when racial discrimination was legal in her society. Racial discrimination may no longer be legal in most countries, but it's still widespread in many countries. Second, Henrietta Lacks was exploited. She is one of many women of color whose bodies has been misused by science. She placed her trust in the health system so she could receive treatment. But the system took something from her without her knowledge or consent. And third, the medical technologies that were developed from this injustice have been used to perpetuate further injustice because they have not been shared equitably around the world. Henrietta's cells were foundational in the development of HIV, HPV vaccines that can eliminate the same cancer that took her life. But in countries with the highest burden of cervical cancer, those vaccines are not available in sufficient doses. 
Likewise, although her cells have been used in COVID-19 research, the tools to stop the disease are not being shared enough with low and middle income countries, nor are many other life-saving innovations developed with Henrietta's miraculous Ella cells. Many people have benefited from those cells. Fortunes have been made. Science has advanced. Nobel Prizes have been won. And most importantly, many lives have been saved. No doubt, Henrietta would have been pleased that her suffering has saved others. But the end doesn't justify the means. All it would have taken was for someone to do her the honor of asking. In honoring Henrietta Lacks today, WHO acknowledged the importance of reckoning with past injustices and advancing racial equity in health and science. Acknowledging the wrongs of the past is essential for building trust for the future. We also recognize the extraordinary potential that her legacy continues to offer. There are many more lives we can save by working for racial justice and equity. We stand in solidarity with marginalized patients and communities all over the world who are not consulted, engaged, or empowered in their own care. We affirm that in medicine and in science, black lives matter. Henrietta Lacks' life mattered and still matters. Today is also an opportunity to recognize those women of color who have made incredible but often unseen contributions to medical science. It's therefore my great honor to present the Director General's Award posthumously to Henrietta Lacks. I invite her son, Mr. Lawrence Lacks, and her great-granddaughter, Victoria Baptist, to receive it on her behalf. I am Lawrence Lacks, senior of Henry Lacks' son. I want to thank everybody and everything for the award that you ever gave her. And it's very beautiful. And I want to thank you and thank you again. There's no words that say how much this means to me. Thank everybody. We'll now hear from Ms. Victoria Baptiste, the great-granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks. Being here today, we are humbled to receive this historic recognition of my great-grandmother, Henrietta Lacks, honoring who she was as a remarkable woman and the lasting impact of her healer selves. Henrietta's contributions, once hidden, are now being rightfully honored for their global impact. On behalf of my family, I would like to thank Dr. Tedros, Dr. Nono, Dr. Parham, and Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, and the World Health Organization for recognizing all the good my grandfather's mother has done for the world. 
acknowledging the invaluable contributions a black woman from the tobacco fields of Clover, Virginia, has contributed to science, medicine, the arts, and beyond. She was a pioneer in life, giving back to her community, helping family and friends live a better life and caring for others. In death, she continues to help the world. Through Hila 100, the Henrietta Lacks Initiative, we educate future generations on the impact of my great-grandmother's HeLa cells. While just like our friends we are here with today at the WHO, we also seek to advance health equity and social justice. My family stands in solidarity with WHO and our sisters around the world to ensure that no other wife, mother, or sister dies needlessly from cervical cancer. As a registered nurse, I am proud to also be here today to honor my great-grandmother's legacy by advocating to ensure equitable access to the breakthroughs that her HeLa cells have advanced, such as HPV and COVID-19 vaccines. It is only fitting that as we commemorate the 70th anniversary of Henrietta Lacks' heal ourselves and her untimely passing, we build upon her legacy by ensuring equitable access to advances in cancer prevention and treatment for all people. We're reclaiming her name and our story. Her legacy lives on in us, and we thank you for saying her name, Henrietta Lacks. We now will turn to Dr. Nono Simalela, the Special Advisor to the Director General and Assistant Director General for Strategic Priorities. Throughout the last year, up to now, the Lacks family has celebrated the 100th anniversary of Henrietta Lacks' birthday. The World Health Organization launched a global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer, which is a great groundbreaking and historic milestone because for the very first time, the global health community has agreed collectively eliminate a cancer. This consists of 194 countries, all member states of the World Health Organization, who have committed to take this challenge and tackle it head on. Although Henrietta Lacks did not receive quality care, neither did she receive respectful care in her time, the fact that the cells were taken from her body without her consent and without her knowledge means that she has left behind a legacy that could potentially save millions of lives. The HPV vaccine, which prevents cervical cancer, was developed using Henrietta Lex's cells. Despite being quite pre-qualified by WHO and made available for commercial use, over 12 years ago, we still have stark inequities in access. In this regard, when we look at the data, we see that more than 85% of high-income countries have access to this vaccine at a very high cost. And this is compared to 
less than 25% of low-income countries and 30% of low-middle-income countries that have not been able to access the HPV vaccine. There has been work done through Gavi that has been extremely crucial to assist and to promote access for low-income countries, low-middle-income countries through their purchasing arrangements with these manufacturers. So a number of countries have been able to access the HPV vaccine, but the supply constraints have meant that countries have not received enough supplies, nor have they been able to vaccinate all the cohorts of young girls that are eligible for vaccination. So in this way, the inequities persist. We believe that this kind of situation is unacceptable and it must make us very angry that here we have a life-saving vaccine contributed to by the life and the passing of an African-American woman, but that access even in the 21st century is shaped by race, ethnicity, geographic differences, and where people are born. We need to be able to say HPV vaccine is available to women and young girls all over the world, wherever they are born, wherever they are brought up, wherever they choose to live and work. And there must be no discrimination on the, on the basis of such minor and irrelevant differences. We owe it to Henrietta Lex and her family to achieve equitable access. A world free from cervical cancer 20, 30 years from now will be an incredible legacy, which will be something built on the legacy left to us by Henrietta Lex. So let us go out there and tackle this disease. The global strategy emphasizes though that dealing with cervical cancer is not only about prevention. We need to screen and treat women with precancerous lesions. We need to treat women who have invasive cancer in good time. And for those with advanced cancer to receive humane, high quality care through palliation and the support of the communities and families. So this is a continuum and the vaccine, yes, the best tool, but let us not forget that screening and treatment holds big promise because then women will not die from advanced cervical cancer and that those where we are too late in the system also pass on in a dignified way. I want to thank you, the Lax family, for their visit, as well as for honoring us by accepting the award that has been uh, given by the Director General of uh, the World Health Organization, the man responsible for the call um, to eliminate cervical cancer. I'd like to say, keep moving, champion the fight to implement this global strategy and to make elimination a possibility. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> I wish you a safe trip home and a lovely, lovely, enjoyable visit in Geneva. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Simalela. I'd now like to turn the floor to Dr. Grosbeck Parham, the co-chair of the Director General's Expert Group on Cervical Cancer Elimination and the clinical expert for our Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative. To close, Dr. Parham. <clears throat> Thank you, Rich. <clears throat> Dr. Tedros, other distinguished guests, and to the family of Mrs. Henrietta Lacks. It is the highest of honors to be here with you today and to participate in this glorious ceremony to celebrate and call attention to not only the countless life-saving contributions of the cells of this great African-American matriarch, Mrs. Henrietta Lacks, but also to bear witness to her indomitable spirit which persists in these cells and that is now calling out to all of us around the world to eliminate cervical cancer. 45 years ago in the 1970s, when I was a pre-medical student, a much younger man than I am now, <laughs> I worked in the laboratory of a very famous gynecologic cancer surgeon by the name of Dr. Hugh M. Shingleton at the University of Alabama in Birmingham in the US. Like many other scientists around the world, Dr. Shingleton was actively engaged in the hunt to try and discover the cause of cervical cancer. His primary tool of investigation was something called a transmission electron microscope. That's a huge microscope back at that time that uses electron particles to look inside of a cell and magnify objects inside the cell up to two million times what the naked eye could see. One of my jobs in the lab was to go to his gynecologic cancer clinic as a pre-medical work-study student and take the cells that he collected from women with cervical cancer back to his laboratory and prepare them for inspection underneath the electron microscope. I remember him always checking to make sure that the women from whom the cells were collected had signed a written consent before we could take them back to the lab. <clears throat> One day in 1976, on my way to work to his lab, I bought a magazine called Ebony, one of the very popular black magazines during that time, like Jet and Sepia and Tan. <clears throat> and as I fanned through the pages, I saw the story about a black woman named Henrietta Lacks. And it caught my eye because it was about cervical cancer, which was what we were working on. The title of the article was The Miracle of Gila, 1976. Last night, I found the magazine online, and the first paragraph reads as follows. An obscure black woman without training in medicine has ironically become one of the pivotal figures in the fight against cancer. Mrs. Henrietta Lacks, the mother of five, died five years ago, but her cancerous cells are being studiously preserved as an important instrument of science. And it went on to talk about the HeLa cells and their unique capacity and ability to divide. The next year, I entered medical school and later went on to become a gynecologic cancer surgeon myself with a special interest in cancer of the cervix. <clears throat> I have been living in the African continent, in the African country of Zambia for the past 15, 16 years, working with the government of that country to establish clinics and programs to prevent and treat cervical cancer. And during that time, we have developed the largest cervical cancer screening program on the continent of Africa, having screened over one million women. There are presently five weapons in our arsenal to fight cervical cancer today. 
the HPV vaccine, which you've heard many people talk about today to prevent young girls from ever getting infected with the virus that causes cervical cancer, cervical cancer screening test to identify women who have precancer, which can be cured almost 100% of the time, and the equipment to treat it, cancer surgery to treat women who have cervical cancer when it's found very early, chemotherapy and radiation to treat cervical cancer when it is detected in its later stages, and pathology laboratories, which are needed to make the initial diagnosis. If I had a map of the world, and on that map, I showed you places where cervical cancer causes the most misery, suffering, pain, and death. And I also showed you on the same map the places in the world where women had the least access to HPV vaccines, cervical cancer screening tests, cancer surgeons and pathologists, and the least amount of chemotherapy and radiation therapy machines, they would be the same. In other words, the places in the world that have the highest burden of cervical cancer, as the Director General has said, are the same places where the tools, technology, and human resources to prevent and treat the disease are least available. And these places are in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, South and Central America, and India, where the vast majority of the 600,000 women who are diagnosed with cervical cancer every year and the 300,000 women who die from it reside. I don't care how you cut it. I don't care how you say it. That's inequity. That's racial injustice. That is a human injustice. That is an international tragedy. When we talk about the impact of cervical cancer in these parts of the world where women have very little access to prevention and treatment, understand that we're talking about young women, women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, women with children, young women who are dying premature deaths from a preventable disease and leaving young children behind to fend for themselves in some of the poorest and harshest environments on the planet. It's one thing to lose a mother, as you know, but it's another to lose a mother in a place where the hellhounds of deep poverty, starvation, and communicable diseases like cholera, malaria, tuberculosis, measles, and polio are biting at their heels on a daily basis as young children. We now know that premature deaths of mothers in these harsh global settings impact the children's education. Those who are less than 10 rarely graduate from high school. It impacts their nutrition, their growth rates are stunted, and their intellectual development is truncated, and they die early deaths. In a recent study led by a, a group of scientists at an organization called IARC, which is, which is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the research arm of the WHO, it was predicted that across the continent of Africa, for every 100 young mothers who die from cervical cancer or breast cancer, but we're talking about cervix today, for every 100 young mothers who die from cervical cancer, up to 30 children under age 10 will also die. This demonstrates the power, the influence, and the importance of women and mothers. When they die young, their young children are also at risk of dying because of the absence of the care for which the mother was responsible whether directly or indirectly. That's the power of a mother's love, which has been destroyed by cervical cancer. The diseases and circumstances from which the children die are the usual causes of death, 
in these settings, diarrhea, measles, malaria, malnutrition, and acute respiratory diseases. So in essence, cervical cancer is a weapon that destabilizes families in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and represses the development of these societies by prematurely killing its young women, killing its young mothers, and killing their children. So in summary, the fight to eliminate cervical cancer, which has been alluded to, is part of a larger fight for human rights. Through her immortal cells, which are called the HeLa cells, that have saved hundreds of millions of lives, the spirit of Mrs. Henrietta Lacks speaks to us, calling our attention to the millions of young women and mothers in low-income countries who continue to die from this disease simply because they cannot access and afford to purchase the life-saving medicines, technologies, and medical procedures that are readily available to those who live in high-income countries. The questions being raised by the spirit and legacy, to me, of Mrs. Henrietta Lacks are the following. This is what I think her spirit is asking. Why does this situation exist in the first place? Why does it continue to exist? What are the solutions and when are you going to implement them? When will the pharmaceutical companies finally make the HP vac HPV vaccines available to young girls in these countries at an affordable price? When? When will local governments and their international partners create the training programs that can produce more doctors, nurses, and other healthcare personnel to screen and treat women with affordable tests and in clinics that are accessible? When will the virtual reality simulation technology be, be used to rapidly train surgeons in large numbers who are able to provide safe, affordable, and timely cancer surgery? And when will the digital and artificial intelligence technology that is exploding across high-income countries, when will it be applied on a large scale to cancer care to close the gaps in human resources in low and middle income countries? And when will corporations finally lower the prices of the much needed chemotherapy and radiation therapy machines so they become affordable? And when will we begin to transfer this technology from high income countries to low income countries? And better yet, when do we begin to develop schools and institutes of science and technology in Africa, Asia, and Latin America to develop and harvest the intelligence of young people who live in these environments so they can invent the technology that is contextually appropriate? The solutions exist but they are concentrated in high-income countries. It's time to implement them on a broad scale in all global settings. It is in this way that we truly honor Mrs. Henrietta Lacks and immortalize her miracle. Otherwise, we are no better than a photographer looking through a camera lens at a vulture as he devours a child weakened from starvation in an open field. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parham. Thank you to the Lax family. Thank you, everybody who's been watching this online for a special historic moment for the organization. This now concludes today's program. Thank you.